Hit up. Just give me a couple of minutes. I'm running a little bit behind. Give me a couple of seconds. And can somebody send a message in the chat to make sure we can you can hear hear me clearly? Chiamo Medinde Ojirafo Kwesi Rade Hambata Khan. Akwamu Maina Marukai Tifi Mu Ojirafu. That means my name is Ojirafo Kwesi Rade Hambata Khan. I'm the Ojirafo of the Kwamu, Akwamu Nation in North America. Eneye Benada Eneye Maokeru Da. That means today is Tuesday. Today is Maokeru Day. Um, Medase for checking us out. So we're going to deal with part two of the section on the Akradin Bosong. We started with Par 1 in the previous session talking about Awusi and this Par 2 we're going to be dealing with Ajua who is called Aset in ancient Kemet and Oduwa in Yoruba and Minona in Fon and Ebe in Vodun and Idemili in Igbo. So, but first before we get into that there's something that came up um, earlier today and I want to talk about that first and it also ties into what we're going to be discussing with regard to um, Ajua. So what came up, I was having a discussion or I joined into a discussion um, about the opening of the mouth and the eyes ceremony in ancient Kemet. So you often hear about, you often read about the opening of the mouth in ancient Kemet, ritual practices that are done with not only the statues um, and reliefs of the deceased person, the so-called mummy of the de deceased person, but it's really dealing with the spirit of the deceased person. You'll see the different murals of them using various implements to open the mouth and open the eyes of the deceased. And in the text, it will talk about I'm opening the eyes of the deceased, I'm, I'm having my mouth open ritually so that I can speak to the Abosom, the deity, so I can speak to the spirit so I can walk freely in and out of the ancestral realm, the spirit realm. So somebody had a question about that with regard to how it's treated in Egyptology and what does the opening of the mouth uh, ceremony and the opening of the eye ceremony actually represent. Now, when, when you read books about it, especially with regard to Egyptology books or even some chemitology articles, they'll talk about different things. They'll talk about opening up the senses and, and stuff like that. Some people will try to talk about, oh, it's, it's just a mystical, um, uh, sim symbolic, mystical language talking about opening up the third eye and opening up your divine consciousness. And it's really not that. The opening of the mouth ceremony, opening of the mouth, opening of the eyes, that's something that's practiced all across Afuraka, Afuraikai, in various um, forms um, in ancient Kemet, ancient Kanit, Nubia, as well as um, contemporary Afuraka, Afuraika. When we read the text and it's talking about, may my eyes be open, may my mouth be open so that I can speak to the Abosom, so that I can move freely, so I won't have any blockages in the ancestral realm, we can look at something very um, practical that many of us have gone through and you'll see the connection because it's really the same thing. Now in the sleep state there's a condition that in Afurakani, Afuraikaitni culture we understand very often discarnate, some often discarnate wayward uh, earthbound spirits will try to um, attack or control or harass a person during the sleep state. Now the Achiwadifo call that condition sleep paralysis, but it's really more than that. They'll try to associate it with different uh, processes going on neuro neurologically. But sleep paralysis in, in Hoodoo, for example, Afurakani, Afuraikaitni 
people in America who practice who do. And of course, we have an article called um, The Akan Origin of the Term Hoodoo. So you'll know that when you look at that article, you'll see um, that's a cultural continuum with us. But in Hoodoo, for example, what they call sleep paralysis is actually referred to as a witch riding someone. So you're asleep, and all of a sudden you feel paralyzed. You can't open your mouth. You can't speak, you can't move, you're struggling, you can't open your eyes, you may be experiencing some negative energy with other entities in the so-called dream state or the in-between state, which we call the Adai state. So they call it sleep paralysis, but in reality you can't move, you're trying, you may be trying to scream for help, you can't do that, you can't open your eyes very often, those different occurrences What's very often happening is an ancestral spirit, a discarnate, wayward ancestral spirit, an uncultivated ancestral spirit, or discarnate spirit that is not a relative sometimes, feel, often feels like the, the spirit is sitting on a person's chest, or sitting on your chest, almost feel like suffocation sometimes, um, a negative aspect of control. And what's happening is that those spirits are trying to control the individual. These are lustful, misguided, uh, discarnate spirits. Very often, the only thing that repels these kinds of spirits is when you attune yourself to your Nananoman Samanfo or some positive uh, ancestral spirits, the Asamanfo Pa, who may not be totally um, spiritually cultivated, but they have your best interests at heart. Or if you know something about the Abosom, or you just instinctively attune to your Alkra and attune to the Supreme Being and try to regenerate the energy to repel them, just calling on the Nananom and Samanfo, the Egungun, the Kuvito, um, calling on the Abosom, the Orisha, even just by name, often that's the only thing that will repel them. Even if you focus on it uh, spiritually in your Adwini, in your mind, that will generate the connection to those spirits and they will repel the wayward spirits. But what happens is when you look at that process, this is during the sleep state, which we call the Adai state. In, in our con, to lie down and go to sleep is Da, or Dai in the dream state is Adai. But that's also a term for the ritual state. When we suspend regular time, and we go into the Adai state, which means the sacred ritual state. And in our con culture, there's a epi, a proverb that basically says, if you want to understand what the after death state is like, consider the dream state because it's very similar. You're laying in a dark room, you can't see any you don't see anything, you don't hear anything, you're laying still, but when you're dreaming, you're engaging with other spiritual entities, you're engaging in all kinds of behavior and all kinds of activities, even though your body is laying down in a cool, dark, quiet room. And it's the same thing with the after death state. Your body is in a cool, dark, quiet place but your spirit is interacting with other entities in the spirit realm. So it's the same thing when you look at the so-called sleep paralysis. What's going on very often is beyond somebody just having some physiological disorder. What's very often happening is an uncultivated spirit, sometimes attempting to do harm, sometimes uncultivated in the sense that some depressed spirit, somebody who committed suicide, somebody who's wayward and they're trying to um, turn you on to their existence, turn you on to their plight. They see that you're more receptive than other people in the family. So you're the go-to person because you're the only one paying attention to that kind of stuff. You were open since you were a child. You were receptive since you were a child. You used to see spirits when you were a child, out-of-body experiences when you were younger. You may have shut it down when you got older, but now you're starting to get back into ancestral religion. Those experiences are beginning to come back to you. So they see that you're the only one that's paying attention so they're going to jump on you and you're going to have an inordinate amount of ancestral spirits as well as discarnate wayward spirits who are trying to connect to you. But just like with the opening of the mouth ceremony, when the prayers are to the abosom, prayers to abosom like Tahuti in the opening of the mouth to protect the person, prayers to other abosom like Heru and Set and others to protect the person, what's happening is in the opening of the mouth, when they do the ritual is to open the mouth so that the person can speak 
open the eyes so that the person can see, and they also talk about so that I can have movement and move freely within the spirit realm. Just like it happens during sleep, when you're trying to open your mouth and you can't, you're trying to open your eyes and you can't, you're trying to move and you can't, but when you call on the ancestral spirits and the abosom, the nanonoman samaf on the abosom, then you, you get freed up. You can move, you can see, you can speak, and so forth. In the after death state, there are certain spirits who, when they die, they don't make that transition. We talked about this in a previous session. They don't make that transition smoothly to the ancestral realm. So what happens is they become earthbound spirits and they're just wayward. Quote unquote haunting houses, the places where they were murdered, the places where they died and so forth. So they latch on, like leeches sometimes, latch on to those who are paying attention, harassing people and so forth. So just like you did in the sleep state instinctively and you tried to open your mouth and open your eyes so you can communicate with the abosom and move freely and have freedom of movement and interaction so that you can live in harmony with your own okra. In the after death state we have funerary practices where when the person makes their transition from this world to the spirit realm we invoke the abosom, we invoke the nananun samanfo the Ntoru, Ntoru Tu, and the Aku, Akutu, so that the person can be protected, so they have the Tumi, the power, the Ashe, to repel these earthbound, waver spirits who are out here, who would otherwise try to trap them and control them and keep them from moving freely to the ancestral realm. So we have funerary practices set up based on our experience with these entities over millions of years. So we've established a culture whereby people who make their transition, we have a pathway to, for them to make a trans smooth transition to the ancestral realm. That's intelligent, that's mature. And in fact, when we talk about ancient Afuraikani, Afuraikaitni civilizations and how we're able to maintain civilization, one of the num number one ways to maintain order an ordered civ a civilization, which is really defined as a social order rooted in the divine order of creation. When you have a social order rooted in divine order, then you have a civilization. If you have a society that's not rooted in divine order, it's just a society, but it's not a civilization, it's not civilized. Civilization means you're living in harmony with divine order, and you have a society structured after the pattern of divine order. So if you want to maintain civilization, one of the most important ways to do that is fu through funerary practices. This is one of the reasons why in ancient Kemet, often people will say, well, they were preoccupied with death. That's not true, because they had temples and so forth on the eastern you know, banks of the, the river, the Hapi. And then, of course, they had the valley of the deceased of the Aku, the Akutu, the Ament land or the western land or the land of the setting, Aten, the sun, where the uh, Meru, the pyramids were built, dealing with the, the sun setting and people making their transition. We had both. We had the living, living in this world and the deceased. Well, one of the reasons why we had so many funerary practices is because when you, when you have sound funerary practices, what you do is most people who make their transition, they make a smooth transition to the ancestral realm. So you reduce the number of spirits that are earthbound. And when you reduce the number of spirits that are wayward, discarnate, earthbound, and causing havoc, you reduce the number of people in the larger society who are walking around being influenced by discarnate, uncultivated relatives. When you have discarnate, un uh, uncultivated relatives in the houses of people, out in their places of, of work, of business, and connected to people all day long, especially the receptive people, these spirits cause people to engage in uh, self-destructive activities. They influence them, just like you have a person who influence you, influences you just throughout the course of the day. They may influence you to join in smoking and drinking with them, getting drunk, getting high. When those spirits become deceased, when, they, when those individuals die and become discarnate spirits, and they're just hovering around, they start to, they continue to try to influence you. They try to influence you negatively because they themselves are lustful spirits as well. 
So they will continue those negative influences. They'll continue to project lust. It's one thing to have somebody sitting in front of you and always trying to influence you to do things that you know are negative. Sometimes you may go along with it, but after a while through maturity, you say, well, this is foolishness. I'm not going to continue to follow this person. I have to be my own person and so forth. But when somebody transitions and dies and they're a discarnate spirit and they're still trying to influence you, if you don't know any better, you think that the thoughts that you're having, these lusts and these feelings that you're having, is your thoughts. It must be your thoughts because it's in your, your head. So that's why they talk about people's finances being um, negatively affected, people making bad decisions, people cheating on their girlfriends, cheating on their boyfriends and so forth. When you have negative spirits promoting lustful activities and stimulating negative thoughts and lustful thoughts within you and you're not focused, then you're easily influenced because you don't realize that this, that's somebody else. If they were standing in front of you as a physical person saying, let's go do this, you can easily reject them. If they're in your, connected to your spirit, near your aura, and whispering and influencing and pushing that kind of energy on you, you may feel like it's just you. So when you have many, many, many earthbound spirits all over the place, in people's homes, in the villages, and so forth, you have uh, greater opportunities for people to make bad decisions, self-destructive decisions, that erode the fabric of the culture. So when you have good funerary practices, you reduce the number of wayward earthbound spirits. You basically, it's like an immigration system. It's like, you know, you deport through funerary practices, you deport these wayward spirits from being earthbound, you deport them to the ancestral realm and let the Nananum Unsamampo and Asamampo Pa deal with them accordingly. And then you have a very small population of these earthbound spirits in, in the society, and you have less. Uh, opportunities for disorder. Then the people, on the other hand, beyond the funerary practices, but the regular ritual practices that everybody engages in, like ancestral communication, dealing with the Okra, dealing with the Abosom, rituals, uh, real holidays, which we're going to get into t later tonight. Um, those things are for the development and co of the people individually and the cohesion of the society. So when you have ritual practices for the, for the society, for the individuals and group in the society, and then you have sound funerary practices, you, you enhance civilization. You're able to maintain civilization. The less, uh, the less, the smaller population of discarnate wayward spirits that you have, the greater um, soundness of your civilization. So we just wanted to get into that um, because that's something that came up. And let, let me see, does anybody have any questions on that, the, the so-called sleep paralysis, uh, before we get into Ajua. Okay, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Hold on one second. Um, Brother As, is it possible that we as a whole are stuck in reform? mentality because we can only call on reform minded ancestors um, you mean well no, no I mean I, I know what I'm thinking you're saying those who are uh, the, the ancestresses and ancestors who have been focused on restoring order is that the kind of ancestral spirits you're talking about but we have we have if not if we have access not only to those who we're trying to reform things, restore order, restore civilization. Uh, but we have access to all of our Nananum and Samapho. We have access to our Samapho Pa. So, and even to the ones who are not, you know, um, spiritually cultivated. So we have access to the, the different groups, um, those who are ancient, who haven't incarnated in hundreds of years, or over a thousand years, and we have uh, access to those who have been recently departed. One of the reasons why we're focused on so much uh, reform, that goes back to the Nkra and the Nkrabia. Those of us who were given that specific function to execute in the world, part of that immune system function, uh, circulatory system function within the great divine body, 
some of us have come here and we have these natural inclinations towards restoration, uh, sessio, nation building, nation restoration, because that's part of our function. It's like some of the immune system cells, they are to restore order when disorder has occurred, that's their function, and they come into the world to execute that function. So we are naturally inclined not only to execute that function, but because we have, we, we have that in Kra and in Krabia, we are drawn to those specific abosome and those examples of those specific nananum insamafo and asamafo pa who affected reform uh, properly because that's part of our path. Okay, so one more question. Brother asked, uh, how does one know they have witchcraft on them? Now there are different ways to find out. The best way to find out if it's not, you know, an emergency, um, you know, if it's not something going crazy just on a regular basis and you don't have to go and go to someone right away, is developing a relationship with your own kra, your soul, um, and developing a relationship with your nananom nsamanfa. One of the best ways to repel any negative spirits, any wayward spirits, any spirits of disorder is to establish uh, in your home or place of residence, wherever you are, and uh, try for your for your ancestresses and ancestors, for your honorable, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. When you, you're already linked to them, but when you connect with them consciously and deliberately in a focused manner, then they will be present and closer to you on a regular basis and they will work to repel any negative spirits. It's no different than you can talk to people on the phone and you can have you can communicate with me on, on this this live broadcast but there's a difference when you're talking to your people on the phone or you talk you bring your people in your house and talk to them in your house because you are not only hearing them and seeing them but you're feeling that energy and when you establish a shrine, it creates a pulsating energy within your residence to repel these wayward negative spirits. And that's the first line of defense against the witchcraft type spirits. Developing a relationship with your okra, meaning getting in harmony with your okra, learning to communicate with your okra, doing, just doing it on a regular basis. That's the process of learning, knowing when your okra is speaking, when it's pulling you, when it's not your okra. And the okra, of course, is the ori inu, the divine consciousness the ka, the kaet. Um, when you do that, then you know the difference between when some other entity is, is dealing with you and when it's just your own thoughts or your own conditionings and so forth. If something is going on immediately and is very destructive and you have to, you're trying to find out right away, then you know, there are people who are uh, priests and priestesses, there are people who are just, who've been involved in the culture long enough and have enough experience where they can um, inform you of what's going on. Um, so I'll, if, send me an email and I'll, you know, give me some details and I'll try to direct you to some resources if it's something, you know, that's an exigency, an urgency. Okay, we had a couple more questions. Let's see. All right. Okay. So one brother asked about a question about yoga and Qigong. Um, we were talking about how the way they are practiced by the Asians are perversions. Um, the brother said he knows people who increase their energy to a level where they can physically move objects. So if these are perverted practices, how come they work and what are the original African exercises we can do to increase our abilities, levitation, telekinesis, and so forth? So, yeah, when we talk about these perverted practices, it's based on the cosmology. Now, people can engage in, um, and we mentioned this in the webcast, our whole psychic power is not spiritual power. People can develop psychic power. Just like you can develop muscular power. If you go into the gym and work out on a regular basis, you're going to be stronger than 
90% of the people that you come in contact with because most people just don't work out every day. And if you engage in various ritual practices, whether it's meditation or there's some form of ritual movement or you're moving your life force energy, it could be um, even the way you, they practice yoga or qigong or whatever, when we start to move and generate our just electromagnetic energy within our, within our bodies, um, you can en enhance that energy. So some people engage in those practices and that just, you know, it just builds up psychic muscle. That doesn't have anything to do uh, in and of itself with spirituality. Just like somebody can develop their physical uh, structure so that they can get strong, they can get, you know, um, hard, and then they can use their physical musculature to rob banks and commit armed robbery and rape people and so forth. They develop strength and they're more powerful than other people, but they're using that extra power for disorder. So it had nothing to do with spirituality because they got stronger. It's the same thing with psychic power. You can sit down and meditate on a regular basis. You can change your diet. You can change your sleeping patterns. You can change a number of different things so that you can increase your electromagnetic motive power force and then you will be you'll notice really right away you'll be able to hear better you will have more clear audience clairvoyance clear sentience you'll be able to tune into things and the more you engage in these practices the more you'll um you you increase your psychic power that in and of itself does not mean that you're engaged in spirituality so when you're saying it, it works yes those things can work to increase psychic power but it doesn't in and of itself put you in harmony with the divine order. If you're not dealing with your Alkra, then engaging in those practices will just simply empower the person and the conditionings and the lust that they already have. They just have more motive force to carry those things out. Now, there's also um, the kind of spirits that people are working with. Sometimes when people are engaged in what is called telekinesis or levitation, what, what's happening is they're working with discarnate spirits. In our Khan culture, some of these spirits are connected to talismans that we call Sumai. So these Sumai spirits, they're working with these spirits. So when they, they're focused on something, the spirit is moving the thing across the table. Or the spirit is lifting them up. Just like a spirit can possess somebody when they're dancing and make them spin around and fall all over the place, they can also lift somebody up or lift some things up. So in those specific instances, that's not true levitation or telekinesis. What's happening is they just have a spirit working for them. And it doesn't, again, in and of itself, doesn't mean that there's spirituality occurring. It's no different than if you had somebody living, a physical person, go and pick something up or go and pick you up or move something. That's not spiritual, that's just one of your friends lifting you up. And when they make their transition, if you're connected like that with certain spirits, then you can ask them to do work for you and they will do work for you and they're actually um, making these things happen. So it, it's a case by case situation. Some people develop psychic power and they do so because they want to increase their psychic power and it has, it's devoid of anything spiritual. Some people are just working with discarnate spirits and they're um, affecting all these different um, acts that the person, people are talking about. So it just depends. Within every ancestral religious tradition, there are ritual practices and sometimes dealing with medicine that gets people to a certain point. So sometimes people are doing ritual practices. Sometimes they're meditating, they're doing ritual prayers. Sometimes they're doing ritual dance to um, increase that psychic power. Sometimes they're just going straight to the medicine. They're just going straight to the eduru. And they just put the medicine in their eyes and their eyes open up and then they can see clairvoyantly or they put the medicine in their ears and they can hear clairvoyantly. They're hearing things that they've never heard before and seeing spirits that normally they would never see. Now sometimes that plagues people because they don't know how to turn it on and turn it off and they, it, it can cause some people to go insane because they don't know how to navigate and negotiate these different entities that they're coming in contact with and they're being bombarded with, which they were being bombarded with previously but ju they just didn't have the eyes and the ears and the feeling to see and hear and um, experience it. So it's just a case-by-case -case basis, but all the ancestral traditions have different uh, means by which 
we can increase psychic power, we can increase, of course, physical power, but we also can increase uh, spiritual power, tumi, ashe, but that's only through connection with the Nananoma and Samafo, connection with the Abosom, connection with your Akra and what your actual function is. Then you can increase your spiritual power to the extent that you need to increase it, that, that dispensation you were given, um, that potential that you were given by Inyamewa Inyame. Okay. Let me check uh, one more thing, one more question. Okay, so Sankofa Safo said not just to repeal them, also to warn you when they are imbalanced energy spirits in your environment. Yes, yeah, so if you were responding, I believe, to um, what we're talking, we were talking about with regard to establishing an ancestral shrine. So. Okay, so that and that, so I just wanted to bring that up. It was it was connected to the uh, the Nananoma and Samanfo, um piece that we did a few weeks ago, but many people have these experiences. We wanted first to connect the opening of the mouth ceremony, the opening of the eyes, which is anytime you read about anything about ancient Kemet, that's a very popular ritual practice, very extensive that you read about in ancient Kemet, but the Egyptologists and many of the people who are chemitologists or people involved in the culture, they don't know what the ritual practice is about because they either read something from some white Egyptologist or they read something by some black person who claims to be engaged in something ancient comedic. But all they really have done is study some uh, pseudo esotericism, pseudo mysticism from the whites and their offspring, from the Achiwadi folk, from the spirits of disorder. Uh, blackened it up and then retroactively dated it to ancient Kemet. So they have no real understanding about the real practical nature of the opening of the mouth. So we just wanted to get into that. We, we can, we're going to actually write something on that, an uh, article on that, just so people can get some more details on that. Okay, any more questions on that? Okay, so let's, let's deal with Adjua. Now, Adjua Second Akradin Bosom, the name of the day is Joada, which is Monday. So we talked about Awusida in the previous uh, broadcast, which is Asa governing Sunday, Awusida or Akwesida on Joada, which is Monday. Da means day in Chui and Akan. Joa is from Ajua. Now the root of the name Ajua is Jo. And Jo in Chui, in Akan, means to cool. So you have Ajua, which is the female, Abosom, who is all set in ancient Kemet. And then you have the masculine, Ajo, Ajo and Ajua. Now, just we talked about last, the last session that Awusi and Esi are the names of Asar and Aset, Awusiri and Asiri and Asar from ancient Kemet, and Aset. And Copti became Eset or Essi, and then Akan is Essi. So when Asar and Aset are operating in connection with Ra and Ra'et, they're called Asar Ra, Osala in Yoruba, but Osar Ra, um, and Aset Ra'et, when they're operating with Ra and Ra'et through the sun. So then they're called Awusi or Awisi or Asi. That's Asar, and then Esi, which is Aset. When they operate through the moon, they're called Ajua and Ajo. Now, Jo means to cool. It also means uh, calm, to rest. Jo can also mean to cry, to lament, to wail. Um, it means coolness and so forth. There's also, um, Jo also means to cut into pieces. So first, Jo meaning to cool, we're talking about the Ajo, talking about the boson, the moon. Um, you know, the gravitational pull of the moon affects the tides of the earth. So it causes the tides to rise and fall. It also affects the atmosphere of the earth. And because of its effect on the atmosphere and its effect on the tides, and also the tides within our bodies, since our bodies are over 70% water, just like the earth is over 70% water, 
when the tides rise that affects the cooling of the earth. The moon has a cooling effect on the earth because of the rising and, and ebb and flow of the tides. So that's one of the reasons why the moon is referred to, the abosom operating through the moon is, are referred to as Ajo and Ajwa. Now, Ajwa is also called, she has a, an Umrane, which is a praise name, which is Awo. Awo means mother, but Awo also means childbirth, it means nativity, it means labor. Um, wo is a verb which means to beget. Um, awo, fo, means the group of people. Fo, who are awo, means parents because wo means to beget. So the male and female beget or conceive a child. So they are awo, fo, or those group of people, fo, who awo, who beget or conceive a child. Um, wo also means to cool. So Ajua, Aset, she's, she's the cool energy operating through the moon, affects the tides, the rising and falling of the tides, cools us down, cools down the earth, reflects the energy of the Aten, of the Oriya of the sun, and transmits it to earth, regulates that, that transmission of um, life force energy coming from the Aten, coming from the Oriya. And then as Awo, she's the mother. It deals with childbirth, with nativity, um, um, so all those different functions. And wo also means to cool and also to beget. So now when you look at the co combination of those two, coolness and then also childbirth, nativity, the mother, and so forth, in the body, um, Ajawa governs the uterus of the female, the uterus and vagina structure of the female. And the complementary structure is the phallus and the prostate of the male. So the vagina and the uterus structure is complemented by the phallus, really the urethra and the phallus, and the prostate structure. I know some people have, just a few years ago, they started saying that the skin's gland in, in the uh, female is, is, you know, homologous with the... Uh, with the uh, prostate in the male, but the skin gland is connected to the uterus, so it's actually the urethra and prostate is the complement to the uterus, uh, the vagina and the uterus in the female. So through those, those structures, we beget, wo, and motherhood comes from that, ah, wo. Now, in order to beget or to conceive, wo, you have to have Jo or wo, which means coolness, because in order for a cool for the sperm cells to survive and spermatogenesis to to happen, there has to be coolness. It, excessive heat kills sperm cells. This is why one of the um, ways for people to uh, engage in well, basically, not impregnate a female. One of, instead of using condoms, is they you know the male will sit in a very hot bath and it would kill the sperm cells and then that's one of their ways you know is birth control the natural way of birth control um so but and you read on different websites when people are trying to conceive coolness within for within the male reproductive organs is a necessity for the development of sperm cells and it's the same thing in the female you need to have coolness in the womb or else that disrupts the conception process and it can be disruptive and destructive to the ovum if it's excessive heat. So you need coolness, wo, coolness, ajo, for our wo, motherhood, childbirth, nativity, and so forth to connect, to, to happen, to occur. So those terms are not only connected to the energy complex of coolness, but the necessity of coolness for our wo, for um, conception and birth. Now, those two structures, those reproductive structures, the male structure and the female structure, they have points of and regions of reflection. So, and we're talking about reflection, meaning R-E-F-L-E-X-I-O-N. Just like you, there's a such thing as foot reflexology, which simply means that there are different points, pressure points, reflex points within in the foot. When people study, you know, the structure of the foot, they know the different nerve endings connected to the foot and connected to the various organs and structures of the body. 
There are regions of reflection in the uterus and vagina structure, as well as the phallus and the prostate structure of the male. So both male and female have reflexive areas in these reproductive glands. So when these um, structures are stimulated through the sexual act, what you're actually doing is stimulating those regions of reflection, which then connects to the different organs and glands that they're related to. So what's happening is, it's not just about procreativity, you engage in the sexual act as a procreative act, but also you're stimulating the different organs and structures that these regions of the um, male and female reproductive um, structures are connected to. So what happens is you're regulating your organs, systems, and glands through ritual procreative activity. Just like somebody can find the pressure points in the palm, the pressure points in the feet to regulate and restore balance, recalibrate energy within the body, the same thing happens when an Afurakani male and Afurai Kaitni female come together in order and engage in procreative activity. What happens is the points of reflection connect and then they begin to regulate order within the various organs, systems, organs, glands, and organ systems within the body. So when we talk about Ajua and Awusi, Asar and Aset, we talk about Abosom who have a regulatory function within creation. So they regulate the functions of other Abosom. We talked about Asar operating, Awusi, Asar operating the pituitary gland, which is a master gland in the body. So it secretes hormones that affects and regulates the functions of other glands. When we look at Ajua in the reproductive area, what we have is another abosom who has a regulatory function on all of the organs and glands. So Awusi operating from the pituitary gland primarily, although Ajua also has a function in the pituitary gland, and Alsar has a function in the reproductive area. So Alsar and Alset operate here, Alsar and Alset operate in the reproductive areas. Also operating primarily through the pi dominantly through the pi pituitary gland, he regulates um, the functions of other glands. Aset or Ajua operating through the reproductive structures, she regulates the functions of other glands and systems and, and so forth. So now the same thing happens in the great divine body of the Supreme Being. Nyamewa Nyame. Ajua or Awo, operating through the great divine body birth canal. She is the great mother, the great birth canal of the Supreme Being. So she regulates the functions of, of the other Abosom in that capacity. So she births all suns and moons and stars and planets and so forth, just like the female body um, gestates and births the child. And it's a regulatory function. So. First, let, let me see if we have any questions on that so far. And all of this is in the article on Ajua, the Abosom of Joda. Okay. All right. So, so, so what happens is both Asar and Aset are operating through um, regulatory functions through the pituitary and the, the uh, reproductive organs. So now when they connect like that, um, we talk about Alsar, you see Alsar in all white, typically white crown, uh, mummified in white. You see Alset wearing white, but she also wears red and white, sometimes red, sometimes white, sometimes red and white. She also wears blue, she also wears black. But very often you see all set in red, white, or red and white. One of the reasons for that is the white, quote unquote, blood comes from the male. That's the seminal fluid coming from the prostate and so forth. And then the, o the ovum is carried in the red blood. So when the red fluid, the red blood connects with the white, quote unquote, blood, that union facilitates the union of the sperm and the ovum, and then you have the conception, which is 
with regard to Asar and Aset, you have Heru. And this is why you see Heru always wearing the red and the white crown united. The, you'll notice that the white crown is a phallic symbol basically and it penetrates the red crown. So that's the union of Asar and Aset giving birth to Heru. So now we had, I thought I saw one Okay, that's dealing with the psychic part. So, so with regard to um, <clears throat> the names of Ajua and Awusi in ancient Kemet, because we talk about these functions in Akan, but then you have the same names and same functions in ancient Kemet. So just like we talked about um, Aset, when she's operating through the sun in connection with Riot, she's called Aset Riot or Essi in Coptic, and then she's called Essi in Akan. She's also, um, when you look at the term Awur, which becomes Awa in Coptic, it also means pregnancy. So the hieroglyph or the Medu is a female um, reposing on her knees, and she's pregnant. You can see her pregnant stomach, and she's sitting sideways, and she's in the same uh, position as the symbol for Aset's um, headdress, which is actually a throne. The throne that the king and the queen mother sit upon, you actually see on the head of Aset. She wears it on her head. Now, that same throne is in the name of Asar. The first part of his name is As, so Asi, and then the second part is the I, which is Ari. So Asari or Asar, the throne is first, and then the I follows it, or sometimes the I is up under it. For Aset, it's the throne. As, as, and then the, the medut for the letter T, which feminizes, and she wears the throne on her head. So the difference is, the reason why Aset wears the throne on her head is because executive authority for the nation and matricircular or matrilineal uh, succession comes through the female. So her throne is senior to the throne of the king, and the same occurs in Akan culture. The Ahema Gua, meaning the Queen Mother's Gua, or the Queen Mother's Throne, is senior to the Oheni Gua, or the King's Gua, or the King's Throne. Now, one reason for that, we're going back to matrilineal or matricircular succession. When we talk about the cosmology, you have, for example, Shu and Tafnut, who give birth to Geb and Nut. Geb is the male earth divinity. Nut is the great mother who bends over and operates through the sky and she has the stars in her belly. And then Geb and Nut give birth to two sets of twins. They give birth to Asar and Aset, and Set and Nebethet. So Asar comes out first, then Aset comes out second. Now in some Akan cultures, um, some Akan groups, as well as in the Yoruba tradition, the second child of a set of twins is actually the senior child. The first child is the junior. The first child is not the older. The first one is seen as the junior and the second one is the elder. And the reason for that is in our culture when we're going out to survey land that we're going to go occupy we send someone out to go survey the land first and once they determine that the land is safe and it's a place that's har harmonious for us to dwell in then they come back and inform the elders and they open the way for the elders to come forward. So when the first child is born in a set of twins, depending on which um, Akan ethnic group you're dealing with, for example, like the Bono, as well as uh, non-Akan like the Yoruba, the first child that was born in this, these two sets of twins was Awusi, which is Asar. So you have the throne, which makes up the first part of his name, Asi, or As, and then the I, which is the second part, Ari, and it's in front of the throne or under the throne. If it's under the throne, that means the I came out first, or the, when the I is next to the throne, in front of the throne, the I is out first surveying the area and making sure that everything is straight. And then after that, the elder comes out, which is the mother, which is Aset. So that just shows 
there's a reason why in our Khan culture, the queen mother's gua, or throne, is senior to the king's throne, to the Ohenni's throne. It's the same thing in ancient Kemet. It's part of our cosmology in our Khan culture as well as ancient culture of Kemet. When Aset comes out, she be, she, Osara is the junior and she's the senior. Now, um, there's another function we need to touch on with regard to Aset and that has to do with, you'll often see Ajua Aset in the murals of Kemet wailing. Now, one of the words for wailing is Jo, just like it means to cool and it means to um, be calm and at rest and so forth. It also has to do with wailing or crying out loud or lamenting. Now what happens is there's a function, there's a, there's a physiological function for crying, but there's also a ritual function for crying. Um, when you get overheated, your body needs jo, joa, it needs coolness. So your body, quote unquote, cries, meaning it sweats, it releases water to cool it down. Ajua governs that process, just like the moon affects the tides, the rising and falling of the tides according to necessity. So when your body gets overheated and you need some, some balance, then it releases water. And that's Jo, cooling or crying. When you are going through a, through a uh, situation and it generates a great deal of nervous energy, and that nervous energy is very tense and expansive within you, if you don't have a point of release, then that nervous energy can be very explosive and if it implodes, it can not only affect your organs and systems through stress, um, disease and so forth, but it can also cause depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal ideation and so forth. So what happens is you have this surge of nervous energy and there needs to be a cooling period, but there also needs to be a recalibration. So what happens is the energy surges up to the head and then you have a release through the tear ducts of coolness of water to help calm down the body. At the same time, you have a release of sound. Now, Jo means to cool, to calm down, to become at rest, peace, but Jo also means to cry out loud, to lament, and to wail. So when you release the sound, release the energy, the coolness through the eyes, the water, so it helps to cool you down and it's a way to release that nervous energy so it doesn't implode, doesn't become internalized and implode, make you implode, but then you release the sound. And those vibrations, the sound vibrations, help to recalibrate your energy. We know how we listen to songs, certain kinds of music, the sound vibrations help you to recalibrate your energy if you're disordered or if you're jangled or if you're just all over the place, sound has a way of restoring some semblance of balance. When you release the energy through the water, that's cooling the body down, but then you release the sound at the same time that helps to recalibrate your life force energy so you can gain some semblance of stability. That's why we say, Joe, to cry out loud, to lament, to well, Joe, coolness, um, to become at rest, to restore balance and so forth. This is why Ajua is called the great healer, the great healeress um, in our Khan culture. In addition to being the great uh, birth canal of the divine body of supreme being, but she's the cool one who brings reconciliation, who brings healing, who br brings rest, who restores balance, who restores order and so forth. She maintains civilization as a regulatory function, a regulatory divinity, Osar establishes civilization, Aset or Ajua maintains civilization. The sperm cell initiates the process of fertilization, which is a unifying function. Uh, the penetration is a unifying function. When the ovum collapses around the sperm and stabilizes that function and begins the process of cell division, then that's a maintenance function. So you have establishment and then you have maintenance. If you establish civilization and it falls apart, you don't have a civilization. If you have a function where you can have the uh, capacity to maintain a civilization but you haven't initiated the process, then you don't have a civilization. You need to have an expansion and you need to have a contraction. 
Asara establishes Ajua, As Asara or Ajo, Awusi establishes civilization. Ajua, Aset maintains civilization. And it's the same thing going on with Ajua as dealing with Joe, meaning to cry, to lament, and the coolness coming from the eyes. The coolness maintains balance, restores balance. The release of uh, sound waves recalibrates your energy. So when we talk about her being the healer or the healeress, the first responders to uh, disease and pain and so forth is water and sound. And we know that if you, if you hit your arm or go through a, you know, any painful experience, the first responders is ajo, ajwa, water and sound. Water helps to cool you down and balance you out, and the sound helps to recalibrate your energy, and then you can move forward and try to rectify the problem in a proper way. Um, coolness is necessary for reconciliation. When our, in our con culture, they talk about somebody who's a quadjo or an ajwa, somebody born on Monday, the one who um, reconciles or brings balance to a situation, um, negotiates the needs of the individual with the needs of the group, based on divine order, not negotiating with spirits of disorder. We never negotiate with spirits of disorder. We negotiate the needs of the individual based on their encrabia with the needs of the group based on their collective encrabia and the negotiation between those two um, parties is balance. That deals with ahua then it develops strength and it develops health and that's healing and ajo is part of that process, but she facilitates that process. Okay, so let's see if anybody has some questions on that. I see some information going on in the chat. Okay, any questions on that aspect of Ajwa's functioning? Okay, so we've dealt with Ajwa as um, um, Ajwa is the one who cools, as Awo, the great mother, and Awo also means to cool. She's the divine. She's the birth canal, the uterus structure in the female, vagina and uterus structure in the female, and the phallus and prostate structure in the male. They have reflexive areas, so when those areas are stimulated, they regulate the functions of the different organs and glands in the same function in the divine body of the supreme being. She is the birth canal and she regulates the functions of the various abosom operating through creation. So through Asar and Aset, Awusi and Ajwa, they are the king and queen mother who regulate the functions of the different abosom in the spirit realm. Now she also has another Mrane, which is Adai, and this ties into what we talked about in dealing with the sleep paralysis and so forth in the beginning. Adai is just a praise name or umrane for a uh, Monday born for Ajua or Kwajo. And Adai, like we said before, means a sleeping or resting period. So Adai can mean the dream state, but Adai also means a sleeping or a, rest, a resting period or a ritual period. So for example, in our Khan culture, Every sixth Akwesida or Awusida is an Akwesi Adai. It means it's a specific ritual Akwesida, a ritual Sunday. It's the Sunday Adai that we have uh, ancestral observances on that day. So, in fact, this a couple of days ago was Akwesi Adai. It was a specific uh, ritual Akwesida, a ritual Sunday, where we have an Adai celebration or an ancestral celebration. That means it's a sleeping or resting period where we take time out from our regular um, activities and we engage, we enter ritual time and we uh, evoke the Nananom and Samapo, invoke the Abosom and reestablish our connection to our Akra and what we've done in the past six weeks and what we need to look forward to for the next six weeks. This also within that cycle um, Awuku Adai, which is a ritual, or Wednesday Adai. So you have Akwesi Adai on the Sunday, then three and a half weeks later, you have Awuku Adai, 
which is a Wednesday I die, and then two and a half weeks later is the next Akwesi I die, and it's every six weeks for each one. Um, so that I die is the ritual space. I die also means to separate. So that, and that has to do with a couple of things. Um, it has to do with apportionment, it has to do with matrilineal succession, but let's get back to the Adai um, with regard to the ritual state. Um, we talked about Awusi or Asar being the sovereign of the spirit realm. In the previous session we talked about how Awusi, Awu meaning death, so Awu Asi, meaning Asar purified the death process. He's also called Ayisi, Ayi meaning funeral. He purified the funerary process, so showing us to go from um, an honorable elder in the community or honorable elderess going through the funerary process and manifesting as an honorable ancestor or honorable ancestress in the spirit realm. And Asar is the sovereign of the spirit realm. He's the governor. It doesn't mean that he's the oldest divinity per se. Ra and Raet, the creating fratress, are the older divinities. But just like you have a king or a queen mother who appoints their son and, and daughter to come up to be the next queen uh, and king, you also have Ra and Raet appointing Asar and Aset to regulate functions within the spirit realm, just like the pituitary gland and the reproductive organs regulate from top down and from bottom up all the functions of this area here. Um, you have Asar and Aset regulating the functions of all the divine organs within the bo divine body of supreme being. So we talked about Asara governing the um, spirit realm, which is going through the Adai state, whether you pass on Adai, you make that transition to the ancestral realm, but you also enter the ancestral realm throughout your lifetime on a regular basis, specifically when you're asleep and when you're engaged in ritual practices. When you're asleep, that's also called I die. And you're asleep for a number of hours, one third of your life, basically, typically on average, you're in the I die state. You also enter that I die state in your lifetime when you engage in ritual practice. So when you're operating through the, the, the spirit realm during your lifetime, our set governs your birth, our woe, into the spirit realm during the I die state. She governs your birth, I will, into the spirit realm during the daydreaming state or the ritual state when you're engaged in libation or ritual song, ritual dance, and so forth. So just like she's governing the I die state, the spirit realm through your lifetime, then the after death state, Asar is the sovereign of the spirit realm. So Asar and Aset during your lifetime and in the after death state they are the male and female sovereigns of those realms. Now, I die dealing with separation and apportionment. That's also connected to the term Jo, meaning separation and apportionment. That has to do, that means to cut into pieces, to separate, and so forth. So what does Jo, meaning coolness, and you know rest, and all, all that information we talked about before, but Jo also meaning to cut to separate into pieces. Joe meaning to cut to separate into pieces has to do with matrilineal or matricircular succession because we are matricircular people meaning um, our succession and our inheritance comes through the mother then things are apportioned or separated through the matrilineal side of the family. So when a male and a female have a you know have a child, um, the child gets comes through the mother's side and all the all the authority to rule comes through the mother's side. So if the father was a king and the mother well if no the father wasn't a king and the mother is, she's of royal blood, then it's her children who are of royal blood. The father can be from another clan that's not a doesn't have any royalty in the clan. But if the mother's clan, if she's from the Asona clan, 
and that's the ruling clan, then she, her children will be of the same clan. They are not of the same clan as the father. So if you have a, a male Akan person and he's from the Agona clan, and then you have a female Akan person who's from the Oyoko clan, when they get married, an Oyoko clan person and an Agona clan person, when they have the baby, the baby is from the Oyoko clan, from the mother's clan. He is not the Agona clan, from the father. He's the mother's clan. And for example, amongst the Asante, the Asante Hene, or the king of Asante, can only come from the Oyoko clan. So that's, that's the clan where the royalty is um, chosen from. So, Jo meaning to separate to a portion. Um, physiologically, it has relevance because when the sperm and the ovum unite, then cell division or apportionment takes place within the mother. It doesn't take place, of course, in the father. It takes place within the womb of the mother. So then even in the society, as a replication of what's going on on the inside, um, division, apportionment, um, succession happens through the mother's clan. Okay, so let's see if there's any questions dealing with that. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit. I posted um, some information when we were getting ready for the presentation, and I was talking about, um, we were going to talk about a little bit about Asara Set and Heru dealing with, of course, this is the fake pseudo holiday Christmas. And anybody, if you listen to the Kuku Tun Tun, the ancestral jurisdiction, you know that we go into detail talking about Jesus never existed and so forth. And same thing with Allah and Bilal and Muhammad and Moses and Buddha and all these, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Solomon, Shiva, Menelik, and so forth. So we go into detail about that. One thing I posted on the site is a picture of the triad. We often hear about Asar, Aset, and Heru, sometimes Ptah, Sekhmet, and Nefertun, but we don't often focus much on a major triad in Ta'apet, which is Amen, Mut, and Kensu. That's the major triad in the region of Ta'apet, which they call Thebes. Now, Amen is, of course, the great god, the masculine aspect, the supreme being, and then Amenet is the great mother. But there's also a divinity, a great abosom, female abosom, called Mut, and Mut means mother. Now, and she's also connected to Amen as a wife of Amen, and through, through Amen and Mut, they have the child called Kensu. Kensu has a number of different titles. One of his titles is Kensu Nefer Hetep Heru, which means the beautiful one uh, who comes in peace. He's a Heru divinity. Sometimes he's shown as a young male with the side lock of hair of the young male and mummified um, as a human Afro-Akani man. But then sometimes he's shown with the body of a man and the head of a hawk, and he looks exactly like uh, Heru, son of Asar and Aset. And the only difference between the two is he wears a crescent moon with a moon disc on his head as opposed to Heru, son of Asar and Aset, wearing the red and the white crown. That's the only way often you can tell the difference between the two. So Kain Su is a healer, he's a protector. He's one connected to the moon. A number of different functions for Kain Su, but his, his name is broken down into Chet, which means child. And Ain Su means royal, um, divine, king, king of southern Kemet. So Chet and Su, or Kain Su, means the divine, royal child. His father is Amen, the great hidden divinity, the great supreme being. His mother is Mut. Mut literally means mother. In, in fact, Mut Her became Mut Ter, a mother in, in English. But the root of it is Mut. So his, he has, his mother is the great mother, and his father is the great Amen, who is the hidden one. So when you read about in the fictional tales of the Bible, which is just a corrupted fragment, that 
Jesus or Jesus or Hensu or Yensu or Yeshua, which comes from Hensu. Father is invisible in heaven, and he's the child of the great Theotokos or the great uh, mother. This is where that aspect is coming from. It's a combination or a conflation of Hensu Neferhetep Heru and then Heru, the son of Osar and the son of Oset. And of course, we also talked about Heru Behudet, which is the same as Ogun or Bena, who is a different Heru divinity. So, going through the story of Osar and Set and Heru, and you can get the details, of course, on the Kukutun Tun, but we talk about Awusi and Ajwa, and Heru is also actually called Yao in Akan, but Awusi and Ajwa are two Abosom, expansive and contractive, who have regulatory functions within creation. Asar unifies the functions of the various Abosom in creation, just like your pituitary gland unifies the functions of the various organs and organ systems in the body through hormonal secretion. Aset has a regulatory function in creation by maintaining the unity of functions of the various organs and organ systems. Just like in your body, you have to have a maintenance of those systems or else it's one thing to have their functions unified, but if it collapses, if it can't be maintained, then you don't have a functioning body. It's the same thing with the, uh, the fertilized ovum. It's one thing for the ovum to be fertilized, but if the functions don't continue to process, if they're not maintained, if that cell division isn't maintained properly and the apportionments aren't orderly, then you don't have an entity, you don't have an organism. So Asar unifies the functions, has the capacity through his energy to unify functions of different organs and organ systems in the body with the different deities, the Abosom in creation. Aset has the capacity contractively to unify and maintain those functions after they have been unified to maintain the continuation of those functions. Asar is about establishing civilization Aset is about the continuity of civilization, the same thing in the body. So these forces in creation, when they talk about Asar and Aset being directed by Ra and Ra'et to be the king and queen of ancient Kemet, that means these are the tutelary Abosom of ancient Kemet. These are the Abosom that our ancestresses and ancestors were directed to worship um, more so with regard to civilization than others because these are the energies, these are the forces in nature, nature who could direct them to unify their functions as a society, as a people, as a collective, and to maintain that unity of functions so that the civilization could be established and the civilization could be continued. Now, of course, there are some people who decide that they want to go outside of the unified functioning of the society, and they engage in disorder. So when we read about Set um, attacking Alsar and killing Alsar and Set's followers, you know, establishing a tyrannical rule and so forth, there are certain individuals who are engaged in disorder. This is not talking about the Abosom fighting each other because that's not part of what happened. The Abosom are Abosom, they are forces in nature. But children of the Abosom who carry the same energy they do fight one another because we haven't developed in a mature fashion very often until we become elders and elderesses. So what happens is, the reason why we really resonate with these stories, as we said before, is because these actual stories of matrilineal succession, succession disputes, people who are on the throne being deposed, being killed, somebody else taking over the throne, that has happened in our families, that has happened in our lineages, that has happened on the continent is happening right now on the continent. There are succession disputes in different areas happening right now. Civil wars about to jump off or have jumped off in the Akan tradition and Yoruba culture. All across the continent there have been many occasions over thousands of years of people who are children of the different Abosom and all Afurakani, Afuraikani people, children of the Abosom. But when we don't live in harmony with the Abosom that governs our Accra, then we get outside of the proper functioning within the parameters of, the, of that energy, and so we begin to create disorder. 
So those who were children of Set, who weren't living in harmony with the energy of Set, of Awuku, then they start perverting the energy that they had. And that will lead them, instead of um, being proper communicators and um, regulators of certain aspects of civilization, then they will engage in lust and disorder. And then when they talk about the story of Set killing Osar, uh, those children of, Os children of Set waging war against the children of Osar, children of Oset, and taking over. That, that's what we're talking about. So what happens is, just like in the body, if your pituitary gland functioning is not functioning properly, and you have hormonal imbalance, and if you're not releasing the proper hormones, then uh, Oset's region, Ajwa's region, is not functioning properly. For example, the pituitary gland secretes oxytocin. That's of course, that happens during uh, childbirth, during labor. Um, it also helps with the letdown um, effect for lactation. But oxytocin is also generated when, with uterine contractions. That stimulates the release of oxytocin from the pituitary gland. So it's released by the pituitary gland and stimulates uterine contractions. But then uterine contractions also, through a feedback mechanism, stimulate the pituitary gland for the release of oxytocin. And that helps with um, uh, childbirth. It helps with lactation. But then oxytocin also is connected with cooling people down, calmness. Um, it actually helps with, you, you'll read about oxytocin dealing with um, helping when people are connected in a, in a bonded way. It helps for the bonding, but then it also propels um, healing with regard to wounds to help wounds heal faster. So when people bond and that release of oxytocin takes place, then wounds that they have will heal faster because it, it helps to reduce inflammation. So again, when we talk about Ajwa being the great healeress, maintaining the unity of functions, the bonding, and being the healer, helping wounds to heal quicker, that's all connected to her. So when you don't have that going on because lust has taken over and you have hormonal imbalance and so forth, then the body is out of whack. Lust or the children of set who are operating out of harmony with the energy of set have caused disruptions within the body. At some point, you want to reestablish harmony. You want to reconnect. So you connect with your, your Akra. You try to realign with your Akra. You try to reconnect your pituitary gland with your, you know, um, reproductive organs and the reflection that occurs with all the different organs and systems in the body. And previously, if you're controlled by lust and desire and anxiety, you notice you can get what they call a, a heavy heart. Now, Heru operates through the heart. When you get a heavy heart, that's like saying the heart is stopped. You get scared, you get anxious, the heart stops. That's like Heru dying. But then when you reestablish order, then the heart starts beating again at a regular pace, then Heru is resurrected. So in the story when they're talking about Heru was killed, and then he was restored by Aset calling on Tahuti, and Tahuti in the boat of Ra stops and comes down and helps Aset to heal Heru and resurrect him from the dead, that's what we're talking about. And the same thing occurred within the society. First our people were following Asar and Aset, establishing civilization, um, agriculture, uh, architecture, all these different things they were putting in place and maintaining a unity. Then of course some people engaged in disorder, um, misguided desire, lust, malice and so forth. They began to disrupt the society and take over the society. And then there's a rule of, of a, a tyrannical rule. Those people who are suffering under a tyrannical rule because they talk about Set killing Osar and throwing him in the water and Aset looking all over the country for him and finally reconnecting with him and spiritually connecting with him and becoming pregnant with Heru and Heru hides, they hide out Heru in the marshes and the whole story is still talking about the people who have been wiped out by Set's rule they were hiding out in different areas of the country at some point they reunited so you have Osar and Aset reuniting. Then they give birth to the Herus, the people who will be the revolutionaries who want to reestablish order, reestablish culture. Once they grow to a point 
where they're strong enough culturally to reestablish culture, then they engage Set, remove him from leadership, and reestablish the kingdom of Balsara and Aset. That goes on in the society, that goes on in the body, um, and it goes on in the spirit. Okay, let's see. Any questions on that? Hold on, let me see what people are talking about. Okay, so any questions on uh, any questions on Ajua? Any of the functions of Ajua? If you have any, um, we we detailed these functions in connection with Ajua's names, her praise names, in the article of Ajo, Ajua, the Abosom of Joada, and Ajo, and we also detail the functions, um, specific functions in the Kukutun Tum when we're talking about. The Asara said in Heru's story. But if you have any questions on the functions of Ajua, of course, we mentioned earlier, Ajua is called Odua in Yoruba. So when we talk about Obatala or Orishanla, and then who's also called Baba Nla, and you have Ianla, which is the great Ia, the great mother, and Baba Nla is the great Baba, the great father. Baba Nla is a title of Orisha Nla, Orisha Nla, or Obatala, Osala, and then Ianla is a title of Odua. Now she, Odua, is also called Odudua. Now, actually, uh, Yoruba people often call themselves Omo Odudua, which means the children of Odudua. Now, because of what has happened with regard to patrilineal succession and a takeover <coughs> excuse me in Yoruba culture they talk about Odudua being a male divinity and the progenitor of the Yoruba race and all these other things but in Ilei Fed and different areas Odudua is an ancient great black mother and she's some, she's very often depicted as a black female sitting down nursing her child just like Asara, just like Aset and Heru, because that's who they are. In Yoruba, her name is Odua or Odudua. No, Dudo means the black one. So Obatala and Odudua, or Osala and Odudua, is actually Awusi and Ajua. Um, Ajua in Igbo is uh, the moon is actually called Onwa, which is related to Ajua which is very related to Odua. All of these you know, names are genetically related. They're conceptually related because they're the same divinities. So um, in Fon and Eve, um, Minona is the name of this Abosom. In fact, Minona is another name related to the term vagina. And in ancient Kemet, the term for vagina, one of the terms is Cha. And Duat, Duat is one of them, it's the opening into the womb. Uh, Cho or Cha or Ocha is one of the titles for vagina. Kayet is one of the titles for vagina. Um, Etwa and Akan is a title of vagina. Etwa and Ajwa is related because she is the great birth canal. She's the great mother, she's the great birth canal in the divine body of the supreme being. So Ajwa. Adria, which means throne in Akan, um, Etwa, which means vagina, and Twa or Utwa means moon, but Ucha also means vagina in ancient Kemet. So it connects her to the moon, it connects her to the reproductive organ, and it connects her to that which is a re regulatory organ in creation. Okay, so uh, I think we're going to end it there because next, next session we're going to deal with we're going to deal with Abena, who is called Sekhmet in ancient Kemet. But we just wanted to go into detail about Adwa. So when you read the article, um, we've gone over the major points in the article. So when you read the article, if you have any questions, send the questions to, um, send it to nanasom, N-A-N-A-S-O-M, at ojirafo.com. We also have uh, the name site, 
Afuraka, Afuraikai, dot ning, dot com. And you can send questions there. If you're not part of the site, you can join the site. It's a network where a number of different people um, discuss these kinds of issues, have questions, post different things, and so forth. It's a network. Um, and I think that's it. So let me see if we have any other questions before we roll out. Okay. Okay, somebody needed me to type in the email. Hold on one second. Okay, give me a second. I gotta log into the. <clears throat> okay, so it should be going through. Okay, so that's that's the email and let me give you the name site. Okay, so that's the Ning site, afuraka, afuraikai.ning.com, where we deal with these issues in detail. Now, I see uh, Quadro asked um, when the first humans were created, after and from the first landmass, which were parts of the. I didn't see anything after that. Now, uh, Jason asks, will you ever do videos on how to specifically develop psychic power? <clears throat> the, the best way to develop that in harmony with order, which I always suggest for any Afurakani, Afurakani person, is to establish an Nkomre with your Nananum and Samafa. That's the best way to first of all tap into what your function is because you of course you're going to deal with your Alkra as well but your Nsamaf will help guide you back to who you are specifically what specific group do you come from what specific ethnic group on the continent do you come from what is your function related to that group what is that group's overall collective in how does that relate to you and then what are your dietary taboos, etiwade, what are your social taboos, what are your etiwade socially, dietarily, culturally, spiritually. So then when you're engaging them, then you can, um, that development of psychic power is just a natural process. I never just tell people, this is what you do to develop psychic power, because our culture is not about just developing psychic power um, devoid of being in connection with your Okra. If it's not in connection with the Okra, with the Abosom, with the Nsamanfo in a harmonious way, then it's a waste of time. It has nothing to do with our culture. That's just um, looking for a power grab, and we don't, I, I never suggest people do that. Everything we're talking about is you came into being to execute a specific function as an Afurakani, Afurakani person. So doing that in harmony with the Abosom and Nsamanfo is what you want to do. So establishing a shrine to Nsamanfo first and dealing with them on a regular basis, that will direct you towards the right path that you came into being to execute anyway. All right. Okay. Um, hold on one second. I had a, saw a couple of questions. Okay, Quadro said, 
the first humans were created after and from the first landmass, which were parts of the uh, supreme being. What are the Achiwadi made of? So I think you're asking where did the Achiwadi folk come from? That's what it looks like. It was kind of broken up. Um, now, if you look in the look at the first video that we did, Nanason Ne Amamre, and we talk about Afura Ka Afura Kaya, and also we have a series. Uh, Afuraka, Afuraika, the origin of the term Africa, parts one, two, three, and four. Um, and we also have the series Mara Nechi, divine law and divine hate, parts one, two, three, four, and five. And also the other videos, the Nanason Ne Amamre, that are all on the Ojirafo uh, YouTube page. Let me let me give you the Ojirafo YouTube page just in case you don't have it. Okay, so I'll just put that up there. So basically what happens, and we, we talked about it in depth, but just like in your body right now, you have trillions of cells. Um, there are some cells about, they would say one out of every 100,000 cells in the body become cancerous at any, any given time. They become disfigured, get, getting energy or toxins from the outside or um, becoming disfigured from uh, negative processes within the inside, they become disfigured and then they begin to consume and destroy the other cells. They become cancerous, they become wayward, they start functioning out of harmony, they start malfunctioning out of harmony with the other cells. Now some cells are slated when they engage in that kind of uh, behavior for self-destruction, autoimmune, but then some st cells uh, set aside for their immune system, the immune system cells come to destroy those cells. In the same process, Afurakanu, Afuraikaitnu, living on earth for millions of years, some of our, a very small percentage of our people, just like a small percentage of your cells, began to engage in disorder. That's when the Okra separates. Now some of them migrated outside of Afuraka, Afuraikait, and were drawn up into northern Eurasia. And after the end of the last ice age, they returned to southern Europe where we were already, you know, we were already inhabiting. And then eventually, Afuraka, Afuraika, they lost their pigmentation because of inbreeding, extra vitiligo characteristics. And we go into detail about this. I'm just giving you a summary. Um, so, but you'll hear it in detail in the previous recordings. And just like the cancerous cells develop within you and your immune system destroys them, we have cancerous cells in the body of black humanity. These are the non-Afurakanu, non-Afuraikaitnu cells, whether they're European, Asian, Hindu, pseudo-Native American, uh, white Hispanics, white uh, Americans, whatever it is. Non-Afurakanu, non-Afuraikaitnu. What happens first is the Okra disengages. When you engage in disorder perpetually, the Okra disengages. Now you're a spirit without an Okra. That's a spiritual degeneration, and then it manifests as a physiological degeneration, and that's where the depigmentation comes from, and that's where the whites and their offspring come from. And then they, you know, began to spread around the world. They started waging war against our people. For thousands of years, they were unsuccessful. And then over time, they began to infiltrate different centers of civilization, look for those points of contention where we were engaged in civil war against one another, they would choose sides, jump on one side to wage war against the other, jump on the other side to wage war against the other, and then they began, after thousands of years of trying to gain the upper hand, they finally gained the upper hand in certain areas. They've basically only been in control, for example, on the continent, like most of the, what they would call sub-Saharan Afuraka, Afuraikai, most of those areas, they've been in control for the past 100 years. They've been there for thousands of years, but most of those areas, it was in the late 1800s, so-called 1800s, 12,800s, early 1900s to 12,900s that they gained control in those areas. Then the liberation movements started about 50 years later. So within 50 years, we started turning things around, but they're still in control because they started infecting people with the Bible and the Quran and all these other fake pseudo-religions with these fake white characters. So now we're in the process 
of purging our people of that foolishness, when we purge them of that foolishness culturally and spiritually, then we'll start to, you know, realize real ahofati, real independence. Okay, so when we're talking about, so just like with the cancerous cells developing from normal cells, if you have a, if you have a, a liver cell that receives toxins from the outside or develop, develops disjointed or discordantly on the inside and it becomes disfigured, you could have a microscope on the cell and it's a normal cell. But when it becomes disfigured, then it becomes unlike the other cells and then it begins to malfunction and only wants to consume and destroy the other cells so now it doesn't look like the other cells any longer and it doesn't function as the other cells and it's the same thing with the whites and their offspring once that okra disengage now you have a different entity and when they reproduce they reproduce entities that are spiritually and then physiologically degenerate the morphological characteristics began to change just because of the movement into the northern into northern Eurasia into the northern hemisphere in the northern parts of the northern hemisphere that but it also had a basis in the spiritual degeneration which manifested as a physical degeneration so that depigmentation it wasn't just about uh, moving into a cold region um, the higher incidence you have of incest is a higher incidence you have of albinism as well as some of these extra vitiligo characteristics, autoimmune um, disease characteristics that you find in the Ashiwati folk. So that disrupts their morphology, that incest that creates, you know, a kind of genetic um, mutation that you keep inbreeding, not just one out of every 10,000 babies born in black community is on average, is born albino, but they have the same internal stores of melanin out of tune that we do. But when you have people who are albino inbreeding with brothers and sisters, um, mothers and fathers, well, well, children and parents, children and grandparents, then you start developing a disfigured physiology, a disfigured morphology, then moving into a higher, uh, you know, northern clime where you don't have the same nutrients and so forth, then bone structures begin, begin to be deformed and so forth. So there, there's a whole range of um, changes that took place, but it starts off with a spiritual degeneration, a separation from the group, and then uh, physical def deform uh, deformation. Yeah, so you asked if there are differences, they are spiritually disengaged from the okra, right? Not only disengaged, they don't have an okra. And that can happen with, you know, that can happen with us. If we engage in disorder, we repel our akra. Our akra is an entity, it's a divinity, it's our personal divinity. So if you engage in disorder, you repel your akra. And we always use the, um, the analogy of two different, having two magnets on the table with the same polarities facing one another. If you put one close to the other, it repels it without touching it every time. If you engage in disorder, you make yourself repulsive of and repulsive to the abosom, to the nanonomans and mafo, but also to your own kra, your own ka, your own soul, that entity that was given to you by inyamewa inyamea, and you repel it. And if you don't, you know, reverse course, you will repel it and it will be gone and that's it. It will return to inyamewa inyamea and be reconnected to the great Ka and kayak, just like a drop of water dissolving into the ocean, and that's it. So now you're an entity without an akra. That's a very extreme example, and that has only happened um, with regard to a group, which the group manifests as the Achiwari fall. Okay. So let's see. Um, I thought I missed one uh, question. Okay, so there was a question about 
Um, you can't do your divine function as long as we are under the Achiwadi for rule can accommodate defeat them. Now we we can defeat them, which we done for thousands of years again. Only the past hundred or so years have they been in control. They were invading ancient Kemet for thousands of years. We gave the example in one of the previous videos of, for example, the Akan um, culture. Achiwadifo were there for over 400 years and they weren't able to control anything until 400 years in. And the only reason they were able to win a war against the Asante, it was the British in coalition with the Fanti, a Akan group that was rivaling the Asante, which is another Akan group, and the British joined up with the Fanti so that together they could wage war against the bigger Akan group. And even the first few wars that they waged against them as a coalition, they lost those. It wasn't until Asante was engaged in a civil war and they were fighting amongst each other. At that point, the British, in coalition with the Fanti and others, they even brought, you know, regiments from the West Indies to join the British and Fanti coalition to wage war against the Asante, who were already in fighting in a civil war, and then they lost that particular war. And that was in the early, they were annexed like 12,902, which means 1902, but then by 1957, they gained their political independence. And they were like the second sub-Saharan, quote-unquote, Afurakani, Afurakani country to gain their independence from Nachiwadifo. After 50 years, I say the second because the first um, sub-Saharan, Afurakani, Afurakani country to gain its independence was a couple of years earlier, which was actually Sudan under a black um, leader, which a lot of people don't know about that. You can look that up. But, so, they had been there for hundreds of years. And even when we were engaged in foolishness and weren't really embracing the culture, we were just on a war footing and, you know, waging war against our own people, we were still repelling the Ashwadifo. So, even if we didn't use the Nkomre and didn't use ancestral religion, we've been fighting the Ashwadifo for thousands of years and the vast majority of that time we've won. It's only been recently that the Ashwadifo have gained control. So we could just wage war against them. We haven't been doing that. Where, where do you look around the, the world? Where are we waging war against Ashiwadifo? Look at what's been in the news in recently with, in America with these so-called these scripted shootings, uh, like Sandy Hook in these different places. Even if even if it was real, if you look at this, the so-called DC sniper from a decade ago even though that was some, you know, scripted, choreographed um, stuff. But if it were real, if there was a brother out and just decided, you know what, I'm just going to start shooting crackers at random. People were scared to get gas on the East Coast while he was out there. And the so-called Sandy Hook thing, you know, they, they used up all the resources of, of the, you know, of law enforcement and shut it down. What if, what if a brother decided to go out to a white school and wipe out some kids who went to a white business or post office where it was an all white community and started just shooting at random. What if 30 brothers did that at 30 places all at the same time at random and they weren't communicating with each other, they just went on their own accord? What, what would happen in a city that would shut the city down? What if 10,000 brothers did that just across the country? at random, without any planning, without any, you know, um, connection to one another, they just start going out and shooting crackers at random. What would happen? That would cause a, a great deal of problems for law enforcement because they wouldn't know when it's coming, how it's coming, why it's coming, what to do about it. They would probably start trying to send the army out and so forth, but it would be nothing they can do. They would, sh you know, show some force but it's, it's nothing they could do. Now, what if it was organized? We haven't waged war against the Achiwadifo. We've been hoping that they would, you know, um, we would appeal to their morality and they would stop treating us the way we've done. But we didn't wage war. And the only people who waged war were the people who were successful here. The maroon type people, the outliers, the people who waged war, people like Nat Turner, the reason why 
slave slavery or enslavement was ended because people like Nat Turner decided we're going to just start wiping out Achiwadifo. We're going to kill as many of them as possible. And when they saw that, and they saw that that, could, that mindset could spread amongst the people, and if it did, we would end up exterminating them, then they were forced to move towards uh, ending enslavement and then figuring out a new way to enslave us with fake religions, with um, making us work for them, sharecropping, giving us tiny salaries and not allowing us to have land and so forth. But if we had moved forward, just like Nana Nat moved forward and others, then you know we'd be talking a different story. So even if we didn't use ancestral religion at all, if we just wage war in an intelligent fashion, we could end this thing. The reason that we engage with the Nananoma and Samanfo and the Abosom and so forth is we're on earth to execute our function and for those of us who are immune system cells and a part of our function is to wage war against the Ashiwadifo, we want to wage war in a fashion where we don't create disorder for ourselves in the process. You can wage war and create disorder. For example, you can wage war against a, a town, a city, or a country and, you know, uh, poison all of the crops, but then you have to eat, so then you're poisoning yourself at the same time. Or you can figure out another way to do it, or you wage war and you don't create disorder on the earth mother and for yourself in the process. So the reason why we utilize the Nkomere, um and dealing with things in a spiritual fashion, first and foremost, because the reason we came into the world, even if the Atiwadifo didn't exist, is to execute a specific function within the world. That's our primary focus. And part of that function is to be able to maintain ourselves, to establish order and to maintain order. And part of maintaining order is destroying disorder. That's part of our divine function just by, by default. Okay, so we use the um, Nkomere to live in harmony with order. So whatever we do, whether it's establishing a civilization or wiping out our enemies, is done in harmony with order. Just like your immune system, it doesn't destroy all the cells in your body when it's killing the cancerous cells. It goes directly to the cancerous cells, it wipes out the cancerous cells, and it maintains the health of your body at the same time. So when we wage war against the Achiwadifo, we need to do it in a, in, a, in a manner where we exterminate the Achiwadifo, but we maintain order within our communities at the same time. Okay, I think I saw a question um, that I missed. Okay. Okay, so we're going to, uh, well, it's almost 9 o'clock, so we're going to end it here. But if you have any questions, again, I, I put the email up, nanasom at ojidafo.com, and then I also put the, the Ning site up, afurakaafurakai.ning.com. We, we go on that. That, that network is kind of similar to Facebook, but it's our own network. Um, and we're on that every day. So we have a number of people uh, on the network, people who ex exchange information. Sometimes they post, you know, post information about themselves or experiences they have, questions that they may have, um, looking for answers about different things, connecting with other people who are engaged in the same process. So um, afurakaafurakai.ning.com, of course, ojidafo.com is our, you know, the major website. And we're also on Facebook at afuraka.afurakayat. Um, and I'll type that in. Okay. All right. And Kamal said we need to break down divine law and divine hate. Um, and actually, we will, because next next week we'll be dealing with Abena, which is Sekhmet, which is you know she's a female aspect. She's the female Abosom of divine hate. So that's Abena, and then Bena, who is Ogun, 
is a male avosum of divine hate. So we're going to start with Ben Abena. We'll probably talk about both, and then the following week we talk about Ben Abena, you know, depending on time. But we're going to start with Abena, and we'll be talking about divine hate in detail. So you're going to read Mada Nechi, Divine Law and Divine Hate, parts 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And you'll also read the article on Abena um, on the Akradin Bosom page. And I'm going to post all of this on, my, on the Facebook and the Afraka, afraka.ning.com site. And you'll also read um, Sekhmet Obra Abosom Menstruation Goddess because Sekhmet Abena governs menstruation. So, may I say for checking out the webcast, and we will be posting this video on YouTube, on the YouTube page tonight. Um, so, may I say.